there's only a very handful of people who are able to connect the dots from a historical, structural, investigative uh, perspective and understanding. One of them is Matthew Arid, whom I heard for the first time on the Corona Investigative Committee led by the uh, German US lawyer, uh, Dr. Rainer Fülmich, and uh, it was a really uh, a totally insightful uh, presentation interview with Matthew Arad and only can encourage you and urge you to listen to that which I'm going to post in the show notes. Matthew Arad is a journalist, investigative journalist, artist. Uh, he does a bunch of things which I'm going to let him introduce himself in our uh, forthcoming talk now. Hope you can enjoy this as much as I did. Um, we had some, uh, some minor, uh, let's say, disagreements on fundamental principles or understanding, you know, when it comes to economics or rational principle, fundamental principles of Austrian economics and Bitcoin, but that's because he has to catch up a little bit with the knowledge. Otherwise, it's, uh, he's a fascinating person, a fascinating investigative journalist. He can put the dots together and really go deep into the rabbit hole of a lot of what is, you know, uh, for the average person called uh, conspiracy theories or, or just not, you know, knowledgeable people, especially for people who are not knowledgeable about uh, what's going on behind the vials, uh, behind the curtain. So we, we talked about, you know, individual sovereignty versus world government. Uh, uh, sh he shed light on oligarchism, uh, social, economical, uh, you know, engineering, uh, social engineering and economical warfare, and so many other, you know, broad range of, of, of topics about the CO2 hoax. Uh, the demonization of CO2, the, the spreading of fear global warming, um, and uh, you know, it's always the same interests that are designed, you know, to persuade humanity that our survival is threatened by non-existent danger. Uh, and yeah, so hope you're gonna enjoy this interview. Let me know your questions, your feedback, your suggestions. Um, uh, we also talked, by the way, about eugenics and, um, you know, the roots, the history of eugenics and, and precursor, you know, and yeah, great reset, monetary reset, so many other topics we could go on uh, for hours, but we had to wrap it up at the end. And I'm sure we, I'm going to get him back on hopefully soon together with Jeff Booth. And I think he should also go on uh, Safed and Amu's podcast to sort of complement one another with, with, with their uh, respective knowledge and comprehension. So, uh, yeah, uh, please enjoy this and let me know what you think. Uh, and please uh, follow Matthew Arit on LinkedIn. And on the YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter and subscribe to the YouTube channel and podcast platforms. And I appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much. Enjoy. All right. Welcome to the show. My name is Kevin Davani. This is the Kevin Davani Connection Show. And uh, I'm really pleased, really honored to have Matthew Arid right. on my show. Let me just turn off my YouTube so I don't have an echo. Um, so, Matthew, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you for having me on. I'm doing great. <laughs> okay, so this is the story. Um, my pleasure, uh, Matthew. I, I found you, you know, out of nowhere on the Corona Investigative Committee uh, led by Dr. Rainer Fülmich, the, the German US uh, licensed lawyer who is doing tremendous work with his colleagues, you know, in his team, uh, digging up or exposing the truth. And, uh, you know, I think he has done already uh, testimonies or interviews with 150, more than 150 experts. Yeah. You just call them also insider, partially insiders, whistleblowers, and it's mind boggling. It just, it's just beyond shocking and mind boggling. And it's good that the truth is coming out. Sunshine, you know, is best is the best disinfectant as someone has said, I think he, he it was his quote or something. So, uh, so Matthew, it, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, but before you know, we go into you know all the, uh, the, the all the, the the important essential uh, you know uh, topics, uh, which I want to talk, and then tie this in somehow. I want to know also your thought, your thoughts, whether you know much or not about Bitcoin. But I want to tie this in like to the monetary root solution, the monetary 
you know, uh, structure, the monetary, uh, what, everything that binds together the, the uh, you know, the criminal organizations, the entities, the central banks, the military industrial complex, the corporations, all these entities that are, you know, uh, uh, fabricating and propagating and executing the agenda, would it be, you know, the climate change, CO2 hoax, <laughs> or the, the, the COVID, uh, you know, madness with all the scientific fraud and manipulation of data and, and uh, tyrannical fascist uh, measures being taken uh, in one country, maybe more in some countries less. It's, um, it's always good to have a bigger picture. And I think for the average listener and viewer, for my listeners and viewers, I think it's always good to have sort of a zoom out and and see like the bigger picture, and then go to the symptoms and the co you know and the and the consequences that we see, and then go to the root solution. Like what are the practical, real, effective solutions uh, from your perspective? So, Matt, I would ask you to introduce yourself. Like uh, sure. you do so many stuff, I don't want to you know like I could read off you know this description. Uh, who are you? I mean, what's what's your background? And that would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Most, most certainly. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I'm a Canadian based author, um, recently, um, publishing a, a new series of books on American history. So a Canadian writing about American history called the clash of the two Americas. Um, Matt volume two of that should be out, uh, this week or next week. Um, basically dealing with 1776 until the present. Um, and the idea that there is not just one history of the U S but there is rather the U S defined by no not a standalone nation in a vacuum, but rather its relationship to the British Empire and the existence of an international financier oligarchy, which has always been there, which people make the mistake of thinking of the British Empire as just the outward expression of it, but they don't realize that it's this, this oligarchical transnational system, which has always killed great American presidents, as well as some great Canadians too. Um, and people around the world. So I tried to situate it within context of, of something broader. Um, I myself uh, became, got into this uh, as a political activist uh, over the years, working with uh, various organizations from 2005, 2006 uh, that were resistant to globalization, but still not exactly fully um, focusing on solutions until um, I stumbled on uh, this organization called the Schiller Institute, which I, I was working with for some time. And... Um, Coming out of that process, I, I began doing research on what was Canada's relationship in terms of its banking system, its geopolitical system to a broader world uh, situation. And I began publishing my works on a, a, a news magazine that I founded in 2012 uh, called the Canadian Patriot Review, um, which itself blossomed into more recently another organization called the Rising Tide Foundation to sort of promote more um, cultural education, inter intercivilizational dialogue and harmony, because there's a lot of there, the, the way that we're being played is that even the best among the citizens of the West who would recognize that there is a conspiracy now, I mean, obviously it's becoming harder and harder to ignore, but for those who have really begun waking up to the reality that there is a depopulation agenda, that it's a longstanding agenda, uh, to get rid of nation states, to institute one world government. This has been something on the books now for a very long time. There's still a tendency because there's not a lot of, um, I find, um, deeper understanding of the of the nature of the game and the, the nature of cultures. How, how has the deep state changed and, and expressed itself in Russia or in China or in India? Because it's the same, it's the same octopus with different cultural expressions. There's good and there's bad. But because of the lack of awareness, a lot of people are falling prey to the um, sleights of hand, which are being put in their path by figures like George Soros, by by uh, Steve Bannon is another operative who is a part of this, uh, this beast, which is getting them to become convinced that their true enemy is China, which really is at the heart of all evil. And it's like, no, when you actually look at what's really shaping our world, it is China's fighting their own fight too against their own deep state. And there's the same people who are out to target the West are out to target China and India as well. So it's, it's not that it's something else. And so that's, that's really where I'm trying to present my, uh, my message, my, uh, my research. And so from there, I know that you, 
um, had a chance to watch my recent presentation on on the Fulmich uh, program, and and that was the third of a series that's ongoing, and we'll see where it goes um, regarding connecting the Great Reset, global warming, and pandemic um, lies as different parts of the same thing. Yeah, that's what I love about your work because you know you're similar also from your approach. Um, uh, like the investigative journalist Whitney Webb, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with her, who, who is able you know, to connect the dots. So I think this is what people are missing. Like, uh, of course, you know, there's not one like, uh, you know, you mentioned these, these, you know, trigger words like conspiracy, conspiracy theorist, and, and, and people, you know, are not aware, like who coined and defined uh, the term conspiracy theory it goes back, you know, to ab- exposed uh, uh, Kennedy assassination, FBI, CIA. You know, when you deviate from the official narrative, from <laughs> the official norm, then you are declared. You can you can debunk. You know, you can immediately debunk or not debunk, but like stigmatize or um, you know uh, make someone laughable somehow. You know, uh, so and I, I know you know uh, understanding like what is really behind behind the curtain is is a lot to digest for a lot for most people you know who are not familiar you know with the intricacies with the details with the uh, before they are not able to connect the dots so that's this is why i love your work and maybe you can you know uh, the, i'm i'm going to put a show um, the, the link to the to the to the interview you did uh, or the presentation uh, on the Corona Investigative Committee with Ryan Fulmich, but could you just summarize a little bit more like what 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 uh, what, what are we dealing here with well, in that particular event, just a few, it was a few days ago, um, it was on, it took place on the cusp of the opening of COP26. It's a, you know, two week long event featuring 25,000 delegates from around the world who are being brought together, corralled together under a very controlled environment um, to try to get world leaders to sign on to their own destruction effectively, um, which means essentially legally enforceable climate reduction policies, so targets to reduce carbon dioxide to um, essentially pre-industrial levels, frankly, um, all with the idea that somehow carbon dioxide is what is driving temperature. So everybody's operating and having these elaborate discussions internationally about shutting down, keeping our temperature within 1.5 degrees of what it was in 1991, because, and, and to do so, we need green new deals, international green initiatives to spread solar panels and, and windmills and, and new banking structures, new rules of insurance and a banking and a finance to only fund those things and to not permit any funding to go into things that cause CO2 to happen. Keeping in mind, of course, that one of the big things that cause CO2 to happen is human breathing. Um, <laughs> but also like pretty much everything that is a, a sustaining part of the industrial economic model from the past 250 years has as a byproduct burning of, of whether it's coal or natural gas or oil or whatever, um, CO2. So it's a, the, the actual point that I try to get at in my presentation is that number one, that's a fraud. CO2 has no, nobody has proven in any way that CO2 and temperature is causal. They are there are two variables that tend to move together, but to say that temperature is caused by CO2 shifts is a fraud. When, and when I tried to go through a bunch of graphs and statistics to demonstrate why when you actually start looking at um, the relationship of these two variables, it is the CO2 which moves, either increases or decreases only after the temperature increases or decreases, meaning that there's something else that we're not looking at. Um, but it's a, it's again this this statistical um, sleight of hand, which they also did for. I mean, there, you see it heavily being deployed around the COVID nineteen fear mongering as well. And when you see people manipulating the statistics to shape these scary graphs about the new global black plague that you know is killing millions of people, it's another sleight of hand. It, there there's not actually a reality that's verifiable to say that this so-called virus is actually killing all these people because we're just simply labeling all like so many different types of deaths that had nothing to do with COVID-19 as COVID-19 deaths. And they've been doing that all around the world, according to World Health Organization protocols. Um, Similarly, you know, there's protocols being put into place around the world for the past 18 months that is actually killing people through a variety of ways that we then label COVID um, from false intubations to uh, just the lockdown itself, which is creating all sorts of nonlinear forms of death. Um, and we're also 
calling people who normally would have the flu COVID, um, which means the, the flu has almost all but disappeared now for the past several seasons. So again, it's, it's all statistical manipulation, but the only way that we can fall for this stuff, and that was my point, my, my general thesis, is that we, we have lost a sense of relationship to our own natural powers of critical thinking and of reasoning, which we are endowed with by the creator when we're born. And the empire has been working very hard for a long time to try different techniques to get their victims to stop thinking and instead allow, in the modern age, computer models to think for them, right? So whatever the computer model, whatever input you put into their, that, that model, that becomes the replacement for your own thought. Or additionally, and or, um, bodies of independent experts that then shape whether it was the ancient times, the high priests that would shape the interpretation of the Bible. Exactly. So, so, today. so the science has become a cult, a cultish religion, because if you stop like questioning, if you stop uh, critical thinking, then, you know, that's the science, as they call it, you know, has turned and transformed into a cultish religion. You, you don't question anything. It's you got to question everything and, and you know, and, and think, of course, rationally, logically, dynamically, you know, adjust like uh, you can't, you know, take a, a computer model and then put it into, you know, and try to squeeze it into your own reality, you know, like. <laughs> it becomes a Pygmalion effect, exactly. And, and you end up like, you, you, you end up programming the conclusions that you want to, uh, to see, right? So the, you, because it's ultimately human beings who are coming up with the computer code, the computer programs, we're the ones choosing which data sets go into the computer and we ignore whatever data sets that disturb our, the, the foregone conclusions that we want the computer to predict. Um, which is, again, you know, something I, I, I tried to poke fun at uh, during my presentation. But, you know, there, there, if you look at it, there's so many um, climatological models uh, that have been, or just data sets that have been just selectively ignored because it demonstrates that there were things like the medieval warming a thousand years ago, far warmer on average than it was today, with, where there was no industry and no, no SUVs. Um, there's there's uh, the ignoring of interplanetary climate change as well, right? Like there's climate change on all of the planetary bodies in our solar system. The Mar Martian ice caps are go growing, going through greater degrees of seasonal melt th than they were in previous years. Why is that? Maybe it has to do with what is going on in, in terms of the sun's electromagnetic field. Why is the sun feasibly giving us signals that we are going into a new ice age? Uh, how is that related to the galaxy? Because all of these things are things that no computer model can know. And when you say that the, the science is settled, the debate is over, you know that that's the death of science. Um, that's, that's the death of any creative yeah. thought. There's no more chance of discovery and you're in a, you're in, in a mental cage. Um, I mean, somehow, so, you know, it doesn't surprise me because um, the, the reason, you know, I also love your, your work because you really go into like the, how they manipulate the, the data, the science, how they, you know, construe all kinds of, uh, you know, hypotheses and, 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 and uh, because I had, you know, research like for at least 10 to 15 years, the internal, once internal documents, which have become, you know, had become since 1999, uh, a publicly accessible, I, I, you know, researched the internal documents of the tobacco industry, of cigarette corporations. Mm -hmm. And, and wrote my PhD work, you know, on it. And, and I found out, you know, how they manipulate everything, you know. I mean, uh, not only, you know, where they uh, massively advanced in their technology, in their science internally, you know, would it be addictive enhancing technologies, uh, 57 pr parameters that could, you know, change the toxicity, addictive nature, addictive potential of, of the nicotine artificially, or the, um, you know, mass psycho psychology marketing to kids yeah. down to three, five years old uh, the knowledge of the tobacco industry or even younger right like like several months old in the mother's belly because yeah. the baby you know nine out of ten doctors think yeah. that you know pregnant mothers should smoke Mar marlboro <laughs> Makes yeah, you should, you should, yeah you should just take a look at the at the advertisement you know from your early 20th century beginning you yeah. know it's like doctors, medical doctors were almost like prescribing or just advocating 
uh, you know, whatever brand or cigarettes or and then later on light cigarettes, which were actually more toxic because you were overcompensating and you had this laser perforated whatever. Anyway, I don't want to go into this rabbit hole. I just want to say <laughs> that it's, it's, it's mind boggling, you know, to see that the strategies that the tobacco industry have been using for at least half a century are, you know, ha have, have been successfully adopted, even refined by big pharma, other corporations, you know, would it be Edward Bernays, the nephew of uh, Sigmund Freud, who was the master of, of deceit and deception and, you know, a manipulation of, of the perception of the people. It's, it's, it's really, we, we gotta, we gotta give it, give it, give credit <laughs> where it's due. They, they've really done a, a beautiful job how people have been brainwashed under, you know, as Rainer Fülmich also said, they had a lot Oh, yeah, it's like people are under mass psychosis, mass hypnosis. It's like they're not even open. Even if you like put the facts on the table, these are like black and white facts, the documents, the data, the connections, you know, you connect the dots, you do all the homework for them. It, it's like, you know, thousands of hours of work. They just don't want to acknowledge it. This is mind boggling to no, me. No, I, I know, I know. And, and, and it's this intimidation thing, right? It, it's um, the, the idea that this, all the scientists agree um, in whether we're talking about global warming or whether we were in, in 1973 talking about cigarettes not causing cancer or whether we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, the COVID thing today um, and, and the measures being promoted to respond to this so-called pandemic. All of the science is in, the scientists all agree, you must be anti-science if you, if you question this. And it's like, well, I know a lot of very professional scientists in all of those fields from climatology uh, to, to viral virology medicine, who all disagree with those conclusions exactly. that, that your particularly selected bodies of experts are, are saying is the, they're being is censored, Matthew. Now, now we've got a huge problem. Now they're being systematically censored, suppressed, and even, I mean, so-called renown. I mean, I don't care whether they're Nobel Prize winners or not, but, you know, I'm we're talking about like, you know, highly, you know, renowned people who should have a, you know, who should have a say in, in their respective field. We're ta talking about Dr. Malone or, you know, insiders, whistleblowers of, you know, former uh, research, whatever, directors of Pfizer. I mean, they're systematically, there's no, even, you know, even uh, like you would you would assume that there are some media platforms that are still mainstream but critical they don't even you know let these people on their stage no yeah it's it's very coordinated and uh, and it becomes like you said a, a, like we were saying a, a pygmalion effect so you you it's like it's like saying oh yeah that person can't possibly win the race but just to prove it i'm going to cut off the, i'm going to break their kneecaps <laughs> and then i'm going to comment on how they're not winning the race and it's like well you know, um but this this is something which is you know like you pointed out this goes this goes back a long time this was applied as a technique for uh, I mean you know the entire science of eugenics is something which people today usually are are a little bit horrified by that there was such a practice that was being taught in Western universities all around the world from the nineteen teens twenties thirties forties you could go to McGill University and Harvard and Yale and you were being fed. Um, the science of eugenics and all of the scientists we were told all agree in this hereditary science of racial purification of the species, according to Darwinian rules of natural selection, except that it's not nature selecting at this point, it's the social engineers who have the scientific knowledge to uh, selectively breed out bad traits from uh, the undesirables of the, of the earth that poison our gene pool by their stupidity or by their tendency to be criminal, um, which we're all, we were all told these are, these are not things that are, are caused by um, unequal political economic systems or principles of justice. None of that. Don't look at that. You can't put those in computer models. Genetics determine, uh, you know, your destiny. It's, it's a, and, and so if your parents were prone to maybe having a low IQ, as if that was even a standard of measuring someone's intelligence, which, which it's not, but regardless. And they say your grandparents and great-grandparents all maybe had a predilection towards, uh, they all had a criminal record. I don't know, let's say that, right? Then they will project, it was a statistical science of projecting into the future probabilistically the likelihood that your grandkids and progeny would also have those same predilections. And then based upon the statistical likelihood, not there's no truth to that, right? There's no guarantee. But the, the possibility on a statistical level, let's say they would come up with the number of 73%, that was then justified to sterilize you or... In the case of Germany, we saw more euthanasia happening under the Tiergarten for uh, uh, health reforms 
which again, we're all funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, the Macy Foundation, all of the foundations that we've seen integrated very closely with the, uh, the international deep state, the Bill Gates, Gavi Institutes in our modern age today, there's a continuity. Uh, the Eugenics Institute of Britain uh, was simply rebranded the Galton Institute in the early, early, early 90s or late 80s, which is highly integrated into the Gavi uh, World Health Organization research complex. Um, so you're like, okay, well, there's a direct continuity. It seems like this, the, the name, the word eugenics got a bad, a bad name because obviously people saw what it would do when somebody enthusiastically puts it into political action in the form of Nazi Germany. Um, so people got a, an ugly sense of, oh, is this what we're actually uh, supporting? Maybe we don't want that. So they had to repackage it. And, and that's another thing that I, I, I've been trying to do in, in many of my writings and presentations is to give people a sense of how certain forces who were never punished in Nuremberg, who were actually the top-down financier backers of fascism throughout the 30s and, and even before that, um, simply repackaged the science of eugenics as a new modern religion, which took several forms, but all interconnected with the same thing. Um, and one of the point men to that was a figure named Julian Huxley, who was part of the, you know, the Huxley clan, which essentially itself, he was carrying on his grandfather's work in a very serious way. You know, people know Thomas Huxley. And, uh, and that was what, you know, Huxley made his fame and fortune off of being discovered as having a lot of talent. He wasn't part of the rich oligarchs. He wasn't a higher bloodline, but he could see that there was a crisis in the, in the 19th century within the empire because the, the world was moving in a creative way. Throughout the 19th century, especially the end of the 19th century, the British Empire had exhausted its resources in trying to keep control of the world system. That was the one world government was the British Empire. India, you know, uh, to around the sun never sets was the the, the statement, right? And uh, and people began to realize the satanic evil of this thing that had consciously had deployed uh, population control measures that that involved controlled famines, controlled wars, division to conquer to keep the slaves from overpopulating and overconsuming resources, according to um, the logic or science of Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus being the British East India Company economist, who was an, he, he basically led, he was a, a pastor. He was a, he had a, he had a, he had a church. Interesting. Uh, uh -huh. But he also, um, he created his own synthetic religion of misanthrop, like he was a misanthropic religion of anti-humanism. He basically said human beings will always grow faster than resources. And so the, the social engineers running the British Empire have to always encourage depopulation to preserve the resources. And so by, in the 19th century, people were getting disgusted and uh, nations started, started invoking their right to control their own economic destiny by measures that we saw from Abraham Lincoln's greenbacks. We saw this deployed by national credit, not private central banks, to emit credit for large-scale development of infrastructure, science, education, and cooperation with other nations, which we had seen with Russia under Sergei Vita, the transport minister in the 19th century, working with his allies in China to build rail between Russia and China with the help of Americans. Uh, the, you know, we had it all over, over Europe. In Germany, you had Otto von Bismarck deploying this to help Germany industrialize and break free of British manipulation. We had it in France. We had it in South America. And the British Empire was was decaying. It, it, it couldn't adapt to the new power of creative um, creative statecraft that was elevating people to a higher status of of cognition. Um, and it was so you know people like Thomas Huxley were deployed to reorganize the British Empire's crusty, rusty management system. It was sort of like a corporate restructuring, and he brought in a new um, governing doctrine, which took the form of the creation of, of Darwin's theory of natural selection, because he said, we have to justify our existence scientifically. Formerly, the British Empire was, was not able to maintain a scientific, Malthus was no longer working. People didn't believe in Malthus because Malthus said the world could not have more than whatever it was, like a billion people at the max, and then we all die. <laughs> And we were obviously beginning to overcome that with, with no problem because we were creative. And Malthus said there's no such thing as creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, the, the idea of justifying, of saying that, look, 
we have to be able to convince people that it's the law of the universe that we exist as an empire pushing the rule of the of the stronger over the weaker. So how do we do that? And so the Darwin theory became just a pretext to repackage Malthus in a more scientifically legitimate veneer and then implo impose that as a way to say, well, you know, I know you don't like the injustice of like the British killing Indians and, and, and Irish and stuff, but that's just the law of nature, you know? Sorry. <laughs> and oh, so that was really okay. what Julian Huxley was doing with eugenics later on. And then so to make it sort of uh, like repackage it in a way so that it's also like social more acceptable. I mean, there's so many questions that popped on my mind. First of all, do you know, like, uh, is it true that the father of Bill Gates uh, was, uh, you know, the, is the former president or was, a, you know, former president of the Planned Parenthood, the Planned Parenthood, the precursor of Planned Parenthood? Uh, is I mean, Planned Parenthood is, what is it? I mean, it's, it's sort of an abortion uh, advocacy group, right? I mean, before that, wasn't that like a eugenics group? Like, uh, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, Margaret Sanger it yeah. was the uh -huh. sort of nominal um, face uh, behind its creation. And she was, yeah, a rabid racist eugenicist to the like nth degree um, who created this organization to promote... Um, Essentially, population control was its mandate, and a variety of techniques were deployed throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s to, to do that. And indeed, you're correct. Bill Gates' father ran it for a very long time. That's, that's why there's all these pictures of Bill Gates' father, Bill Gates Sr., uh, you know, being, being chummy with David Rockefeller, because Rockefeller was a huge part of the machine funding that. Um, he was also the guy who created the Trilateral Commission inside wow. of the United States that that took over control of the U.S. under uh, Carter and Ford. Um, people like Kissinger were a part of the Trilateral Commission, as were Zbigniew Brzezinski. So the entire transformation of the world system, it was initiated by these depopulation fanatic groups um, that really, it was called the Malthusian Revival Um because, you know, like I mentioned, Malthus was going out of favor as people, especially, you know, when you look at after World War II, there was a lot of cultural optimism that we finally had a future that was beautiful for our kids. There was a lot of faith that human beings were, were good. We weren't these evil things that had to be controlled by an elite class. And we were confirming that that was true by doing big projects mm -hmm. that brought out the best in us. Um, and so from the, they call it the, the in France called it les 30 années glorieuses, right? The 30 glorious years after World War II, when we were still building things that were big and people had a sense that, you know, okay, the, the future can be bright. We can wipe out hunger. We can't, but the problem is there was this other thing happening too. And that was this, this other reorganized Anglo-American empire that took over increasing controls of the U.S. over the dead bodies of people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt who died while in office before a lot of his anti-imperial programs could ever see the light of day. Um, many of his allies were crushed um, internationally as well as inside of the United States as the U.S. went into a, an FBI-run dictatorship. And even though you had people like Eisenhower who tried in some ways, you know, to push against it at different times, and he warned about the military-industrial yeah. complex... And, you know, he, he tried in a limited way, but he was very naive. But it was um, too late, probably. I mean, you know, when he warned, like in that speech, his famous speech, you know, war, you know, yeah. be aware, whatever, it was already too late, right? The military industrial I, intelligence, like, you know, deep state, in yeah. na so-called national security complex. Uh, was, wasn't that like too late already by then? Yeah, and he was, um, like, he trusted John Foster Dulles, who was, like, his speechwriter and a shaper of much of his perceptions. He trusted all the wrong people. He had, he had bad instincts, even though he, you could say he was not a bad man. And any, he was not. But, yeah, you're like, well, if you're warning about this right as Kennedy is about to take over, like, what the hell were you doing for the past eight years? Like, couldn't you have possibly have not given this poor, this poor new guy a, such a mess? But, you know, despite that, it was a good warning that he did. Um, and JFK worked valiantly for the 900 days that he was alive against this thing. And, and you can't understand anything about JFK if you don't recognize this, this broader fight that he was, he was like, he picked up the, the torch and, and ran with it in a seriously inspired way. Um, and, you know, you had a lot of people after he died, um, like Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy were collaborators in 1967, 68, 
um, which was pushing society again towards that that anti Malthusian pro development pro cooperation resolution to the Cold War because in the Cold War there was two ways of resolving the Cold War, three ways. One was total extinction, uh, thermonuclear war that could, and some people were even willing to risk it who were very evil, saying, well, maybe we, the world needs a bit of purgative violence, you know? Um, and maybe we could just, like, take in store order out of that chaos, and maybe it's worth it. And then other parts of the elite were like, well, that's a bit of a risk. Let's, let's try to avoid that as much as possible, and maybe we could just push this keep, as the world is in this Manichaean duality of, you know, you're either communist or you're capitalist. You're either all about the individual or you're all about the state. There's no there's no harmony. So as long as we can keep people in that schizophrenic bipolarity, we can manipulate the show from above above divide the and game, rule, right? like divide yeah, and exactly. rule. And, and we can actually just, like divide and rule, divide and rule. This is what they're doing. I mean, that's exactly right? it. Exactly. And then the other the other um, possibility of resolving because that, that that approach was to push that to its limit until you get a controlled disintegration of the system whereby then, you know, without the nuclear war, you could get online a new controlled um, feudal world government as the solution. That's their preferred path and it always has been. Although I would just continuously add, they are willing, they are willing to go the nuclear war route as well if nothing else works. But they would not allow willfully, and when I say they, I'm talking about this financier oligarchy, which... I mean, conspiracy theorist words or not, whatever you want, it exists. There's a continuity of intention and means of carrying out that those intentions based on seriously wrong, rotten ideas about the universe and of, and of nature. So I'm just going to say that. But the other one that they're they're not willing to accept, but it it may very well just happen outside of their will, is the resolution of the Cold War dichotomy by. Um, cooperation through development and john f kennedy was making accolades to the uh the russians to say well let's jointly work together on things that uh bring us together as a species so he called for a space program that would be co-controlled by the russians and the americans right before he was killed um bobby kennedy and martin luther king were calling for similar types of pathways to say okay we need economic justice for everyone in the world and the russians the Chinese, the Americans should all work together on developing infrastructure and science in Africa and other things. And that is the approach that does work. And that's what why today, you know, um, I think the empire, they're working so hard to convince us that the enemies of Western civilization are either the Russians or the Chinese or some combination of the Russians and the Chinese that want to run the, the Great Reset and destroy Western civilization. But it's not true. The, if you actually look at what Russia and China are doing, uh, they are representing an 140 nations increasingly on board with the Belt and Road Initiative. They have an integrated uh, alliance for survival with a completely different uh, political security economic architecture that is outside of, in many ways, the control of the Western financier oligarchy, which is why they're afraid of it and they want to destroy it. And they want to get, get us to give our consent to that military attack on Russia and China that is being planned. So that's a big sleight of hand as well you know wow that's fascinating uh, matthew so let me uh let me wind uh, rewind a little back uh you talked about the financiers of the nuremberg so-called you know mm -hmm. who were prosecuted i mean you know this is the question i've always uh, a lot of people have been asked you know who know the history you know of the nuremberg trials and it, you know it was good that the nuremberg trials you know took place in the first place but if we are honest to ourselves i mean <laughs> they're very financiers you know whether we, we call them you know the, was it the father also amongst others of uh, george Bush senior and you know banks uh, corporations the dupont ibm uh, mm -hmm. The military industrial complex in totality, and then you know the Operation Paperclip, where they imported all these scientists, uh, also Werner von Braun, to the United States, and you know and there's this always these front organizations that are somehow I think I think they're PR organizations like NASA. I think in my opinion, and and, and I think a lot of experts say that that NASA uh, NASA is nothing else than a you know, a, a public relations stunt organization. I mean, I mean, I think you talked about in one of your interviews or, or, or talks, discussions with some colleagues of yours, like how much money 
or like how how underfunded these organizations are actually and how much money flows um, and we know you know from Catherine Austin Fitz who who's been you know an insider and 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 knows that you know I mean how many tens of trillions have been really siphoned off <laughs> into black budgets and and uh, so yeah. um I don't know where, where I was going with this but well no, I, I can comment on that if you yeah, want yeah go ahead yeah um well here's the thing like NASA used to be it, when it was created under Eisenhower, it was some not doing very much. Now, Sputnik changed the world in many ways because nobody thought that that was impossible. Keep in mind, these 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 oligarchs, these imperialists who are Malthusian, they deny the exist. Their 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 religion is key, is a science of limits. Get everybody to obey the science of what you can't do, right? Not what you can do. Real science should be go beyond your limits. That's the point of science, right? You're you're jumping out into the unknown, making proof of principle discoveries translating that back to your fellow human beings and finding different creative ways to improve technology with those new discoveries of the laws of nature. That should be science. They're saying, no, 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 that's not science. <laughs> their, their science is ob obedience to whatever exists now. And maybe you can make modifications of what exists now, but you but can't- But do they believe in it, Matthew? I mean, do they really, uh, are there people like believing in this in this bullshit or, I mean, how how has humanity progressed or advanced? It was because of, you know, improvement in energy efficiency, energy production, uh, refinement of well, technologies, you know, okay. especially under the gold standard, whatever hard money uh, standard. Uh, I mean, there were zero to one technologies, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing, and I'll, I'll link this back to the discussion around NASA, um, but the there's a huge fight in over the definitions of what is human, what, what makes human beings human, uh, what are ideas, how do we think about the relationship between ideas and history, because if you can control those definitions and you can control how people think of the role of mind and matter, which is that's what it is, right? It's, it's the mind is not is not matter. It it, it has a there's a material expression. I obviously I need to have a physical brain to express my thoughts, but is the brain my thoughts? No, the brain is something that was it creatively evolved in time within a universe that has certain characteristics. Obviously, those characteristics must be somehow expressed within the chosen form materially of the brain, right? Um, but it's not the thoughts, the idea of justice, um, the idea of, uh, obviously there's ideas like my cup. This is a different type of idea than an idea of justice or the idea of equality or the idea of freedom. These are different categories of realities. Now the cup, I can imagine it being weighed in, it exists in space and time in a location, right? There's outside the cup, inside the cup. But when I, when I try to apply those, um, rules to something like freedom where is there an outside freedom right or where in where in space and time does freedom exist is there a time before which there was no freedom it's like no these it doesn't work that way it's a different species of idea but the mind which the brain is bounded in space and time the brain has a physical location i could cut it up blah 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 but the 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 uh, the thought of freedom is an unbounded, it's an infinite eternal idea, but it is being expressed by me, a material, non-eternal physical being. So there's obviously, whenever you have a creative discovery, whether it's Kepler's discovery of universal um, harmonics organizing the solar system, or whether you know it, it is something like a geometrical proof, like the doubling of the square or the doubling of the cube that was a, a, something in ancient Athens that compute, you know, obsessed a lot of people, rightfully so or electromagnetic, whatever, whatever the discovery is, it has an impact on that society's whole ability to increase its, uh, its standards of living, right? All of a sudden with the discovery of electricity, we have now the freedom to uh, apply it to the, product, the production process. Um, all of a sudden, what was formerly a limit, which, which was maybe, you know, we could have sustain maybe, you know, I don't know, uh, a certain amount of people hundred people over uh, several square kilometers in this region. Now, all of a sudden we can increase that by several fold, three, 400 people um, in that zone at a higher standard of living. Uh, our life expectancy on average is no longer 43 years of age. It's now, you know, it leaps up to 62 years of age. So we have this, this relationship. It's an, it's a dynamic interplay. And so who can control the, the, the who can control the interpretation of how that works controls the system 
And so there are a lot of uh, false theories of knowledge that have been promoted. Like, for example, Karl Popper, the, the, fault, the, the guy who trained George Soros. Karl Popper is the founder of Open Society and its, it, and its enemies. And if you read Karl Popper's writings from the London School of Economics, which, which is where he was based, you know, as it's a Fabian Society school. Um, he has a whole, he's renowned for having like a very uh, influential theory of knowledge, which is, very, again, it's very influential today. It's false. It's not true. But he says, okay, knowledge in his theory is uh, Darwinian natural selection applied to, the, to, to thoughts. So he says, just like Darwin has random mutations, like that's creativity, right? It's randomness that occasionally blossom in the form of like a bigger feather or a bigger claw that allow the, the stronger to beat out the weaker and the diminishing returns in, in the race for the struggle for survival. That's the material world. He says the same thing for ideas. You got this like random impulse, we'll call it creativity. Um, and we have a bunch of theories in society. The, the stronger theories will beat out the weaker by negation. He says that there's no such thing as a positive proof of any truth. That doesn't exist. There is no positive truth. There's only negations. And the, the, the theories that have the power to beat out weaker theories become what we label as true, but there is no truth. So in his world, the, the, the evolution and adapt, it's all about adaption and the logical extension of previous sets imposing themselves by the power of the stronger over the weaker. And this idea of, of ideas and matter is at the heart also of, of, if you think about it, critical race theory. Like the critical theory, which has been used by and funded by people like George Soros, right, and others, but to, to uh, weaken the spiritual and intellectual fiber of Western civilization, right, so that people start hating everything about their own Western civilization, good and bad alike. Because yeah, we did bad things. Bad things have been done by white people. Sure, I agree. But to say that all things that white people have ever done are all equally bad because they're all rooted in a desire to impose your ideas onto the weaker and, and, and beat out the, the, you know, whatever weaker uh, uh, members of other races or uh, genders in favor of your dominant race or, or, or gender, that's wrong to say that Dante Alighieri and, and Da Vinci and George Washington are all as equal bad as like the Grand Inquisitor or Hitler. It's, but that's, that's really what critical race theory is. It's, it's a response to this artificial false definition of what knowledge is. Now, real knowledge, this gets back to NASA, is based on human, humanity's ability to make leaps beyond um, the limits to our growth. So we make leaps intellectually into the, the fabric of nature, right? We like I said, we translate that. And when it comes throughout, under John F. Kennedy, NASA became um, a driving force of the entire economy. JFK understood that this was the way to break the system of the Cold War. And so, I mean, something like 4% of the GDP of the United States budget was put into NASA, but with concrete objectives. It wasn't just this, like, in the last, you and me, most of our adult lives have been living under a world with it's a, it's a, it's a post-industrial consumer cult that was created in 1971. And so we haven't really experienced anything competent. There's been no goals, no concrete goals, no means to carry out goals. We've been just sort of living moment to moment in a world with no, no, no real goals for nations. The only goals are the goals from the oligarchy. They want to, <laughs> they want to get us to, to, you know, cannibalize ourselves. But so under JFK, you had things like, the entire economy was shaped, whether it was, you know, what today we take things for granted, like uh, GPS, cell phones, internet, uh, medical technologies, AKGs, um, diagnostics, uh, materials processing. I mean, there, there were actually a, a manifold amount of uh, materials, heavy industrial uh, out, uh, uh, processing techniques that came out of the, the NASA program of the 1960s. Uh, it's, nothing was unaffected by this. Everything was shaped by this. And by 1965, two years after JFK was killed, you could you could see the graph of funding of NASA, which went to a max of 4.5%. And then in 1965, by 1966, it was half. And it was Deliberately kind of like reduced to a minimum, right? I mean... Always reduced. To, and by the time, you know, okay. 1968, 69 happened, it was already on its way down. And then ever since they canceled the Apollo programs uh -huh. and they canceled all of, all of the, the, the programs for... 
uh, Mars colonization that were, were big in the 1960s, uh, nuclear rockets, nuclear fusion, fusion propulsion, all of these things were all seriously being backed because it's very expensive to do these types of things. Under the protege of NASA. So at that time, there was no compartmentalized research going on. Like, you know, DARPA is actually the back end organization of NASA right now because there's a it lot wasn't of dominant compartmentalized back then. black budget technologies being evolved, which of course are not civ for civilian use accessible. And that's how, how it was, I think, the last few decades at least. Yeah, yeah, Maybe it got really bad. Actually, after the Second World War, right? I mean, this is why we still are burning fuel. Whatever, you know, sophisticated technologies we have, but we are still burning fuel. Why are we not having, you know, whatever, a hydrogen uh, fueled? I'm sorry, you know, to jump from one topic to another, but- No, no it's all connected, it's fine. <laughs> topic right now. Why do, why, we, I'm, I'm asking myself, a lot of people out there are asking ourselves, you know, and even Safid and Amus, the author of the Bitcoin Standard, which I really want you to read if, if you have any, if you have time for that, because he said, you know, it's it's very strange that the Concorde and some other technology, or the speed of the airplanes, you know, increase exponential, not exponential, but by multitude in the whatever, let's say 60s, 70s, and then dramatically subsided, right? It, it got reduced. So it's a very strange process is going on, you know? Yeah. Well, what I would say, um, there there are indeed, like like in every government, so we, we find in the, in institutions um, positive and negative currents within. We've got deep state evil currents, and we have positive genuine currents in most things. Maybe not everything, but most things. Um, NASA is no exception, and, and certainly there are nefarious forces that have been operational in NASA. Yes, sh sure, absolutely, and things like DARPA, the military industrial complex, black budget. Um, science, all these things. Yes. And, uh, and it's very secretive and, and all of that stuff is absolutely true. In the 1960s was a period of high potential, high density fights between these two currents. Um, one of the things that happened after Bobby Kennedy was killed in, in 68 and Robert, uh, John F. K uh, Martin Luther King, um, same, same month, just a couple of months earlier, uh, was killed in 68. There was a, a real, uh, coup d'etat, that was finalized, uh, especially with the 1971 floating of the US dollar onto the floating exchange rates, the destruction of the gold reserve standard, and increasingly the, the doctrine of, you know, the post nation state era was now upon us. We would now have a world where it would be Darwinian survival. All national regulation would be shut down. Banking regulation would be deregulated. And that, that maintained itself for the next 35 years under globalization. And the idea was always, the people promoting Milton Friedman and deregulation, and I promise you, I'm going to get back to what you've been saying about science. I, I will, but I'm just going on a segue here. Um, the people who have been promoting that never themselves, I mean, <laughs> whether Milton Friedman himself believed in his own theories, maybe he did. But the people who promoted his theories as the gospel, they didn't believe in it. They always wanted just for nation states to lay down their sentinels, protectionism, other things, so that the actual power structures, the private financiers, right, that ran the multinational corporations could then walk into your house and, you know, steal from you and basically destroy your life, destroy your nation states. And that, that was what was we saw with the cartelization under the uh, in the early 80s. You had a lot of the, the small and medium enterprises wiped out under a controlled disintegration under under trilateral commission member uh, Paul Volcker, right? When interest rates were, were hiked up to 22% for two years. The, the only people who could survive those types of interest rates were the, the Walmarts, the big multinationals that ate up and gobbled up all the small guys. You had mergers and acquisitions, right? You had universal banking. The separation of, of investment banking from commercial banking was, was broken and all of a sudden starting with Fat, in Thatcher in 86 with Big Bang, you could all of a sudden have these one shop you know, one-stop shop banks called universal banks. That was finalized in the U.S. with Glass-Steagall's destruction in 1999. And then, so we basically, it was, Dar the logic underlying it was always this Malthusian, Darwinian um, survival of the fittest, right? And, and the creation of a new oligarchical class beholden themselves to a higher power um, as like, you know, modern mercenaries or pirates. The pirates of old, oftentimes, when you look in the 18th century, they often had British intelligence backers that they were loyal to. There was always political, geopolitical power structures that deployed pirates to conduct terrorist operations against shipping trade lines from, anyway, it's a whole thing. 
But so th- th- these guys like George Soros played the role as international speculators, as modern pirates. Um, a- and there was a whole new sort of menagerie uh, created of, of, of mercenaries. So science itself was contaminated throughout that. Now, the thing about um, Concord or magnetic levitation railways, which, you know, Germany was the innovator of maglev rail, except, um, and, and France innovated Concord, Japan, you know, supersonic. Right? Maglev, I mean, don't they have, isn't that, isn't that like. The... Maglev rail, maglev rail, yeah, it's a German technology. The only wow. country that. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, and if you wonder, like, why doesn't Germany have any maglev if they invent, innovated it, right? Siemens and all, like they, that was where the, the science was coming from originally, where they're building your first prototype in the world was in Germany. It was because um, the Malthusians don't like they they want to keep us locked into systems of relationships of old pre existing technologies because it changes. It. And one of the things that happened was there was a sabotage of the technology. So on the inauguration where you had reporters and and uh, statesmen all brought together in Germany to announce this wonderful technology and we were going to see it in action, there was a sabotage and the the prototype uh, derailed and killed everybody. And everyone was horrified, like, we don't want that. And the the, the public zeitgeist was turned into a fear-mongering uh, grouping that said, we, you know, we don't want this. And so the government just shut it down. And the only country in the world that adopted this technology was China, which currently has the only operational maglev and uh, they're building something like five other other lines. Now, they are the Chinese are saying to the West, like, do this too. Like, please, please do this. We'll even help you. And they're trying to export all sorts of tech. Um, the same thing for Concord. I, I think if you look at the, the disasters of Concord or even the di- disasters of a Challenger in the 1980s, 85, when the Challenger spacecraft blew up, um, or look at other things like uh, Three Mile Island, um, that was another example of, of something that uh, there's a lot of evidence to, to point out that these things were all, they were not naturally occurring disasters. They were disasters that were PR stunts in effect to convince, not PR, I mean, not people did die in the case of Challenger and, and uh, Concord, um, but they were done to get, pe- to shut down people's expectations that human beings could go beyond the limits of what exists. And 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 to give their their acquiescence their uh, their their permission to the the shutdown of advanced forms of science and aerospace that would normally be drivers for breaking us out of the computer models that say our limits to growth are 1.5 billion people on the Earth max. You know, um, so the the empire. When I look at when I study imperialism and I, I study oligarchism, what I see going back several thousand years in in open research that's available is a general tendency to ultimately, they will, they will do two things. Try to block any new creative discoveries from happening, as in the case of the Inquisition, for example. Just call everything heresy and, and burn and kill the creative people. You know, burn uh, Giordano Bruno. Regardless of how creative he is or how useful he might be, kill him fast before he can make discoveries. If you cannot kill them directly, if you cannot smother the discovery before it, it happens, like you can't smother the baby in the cradle, you know, all of a sudden, let's say, oh shit, the baby just got out of the cradle and started walking. We can't put it back in. Um, what do you do then? You try to co-opt it and say, we love discoveries and this is like how they happen. And, and then they'll try to redefine how the discovery happens. So nobody actually reads, let's say, for example, um, Johannes Kepler's original writings. They won't read that because Kepler was creative. He was, he was, he was a real creative force. But instead, what, what people will, will say is, well, Kepler, uh, he was a bit of a mystic. Uh, he, he seemed like a decent guy, but the, the real scientist was Isaac Newton, like 80 years later. Now, if you actually look at it, Isaac Newton was, he really, it, it, there's not a lot of evidence that he actually made any discoveries. He himself was an autistic uh, tool used, he was the, the treasurer of the, the secretary of the mint of the Bank of England right when the, the oligarchy was taking control of the British and, and cleansing Britain in, in 1688 under the Glorious Revolution. And, I mean, <laughs> the Venetian Empire had had already taken control and smothered humanist impulses in Amsterdam. They created the Bank of, of, of Amsterdam as a private central bank in 1609. Then after they, they, fir- they, they firmly took control of the Dutch region, they had to crush the... Um, 
the creative moral powerhouses that were still active in Britain that hadn't been crushed yet. And that was what the Glorious Revolution was about, where they installed themselves and, and, and created the world's second private central bank, which, again, Isaac Newton was a key figure in that operation. And part of uh, the, the, this warfare was repackaging creative discoveries made by real scientists like Leibniz on the calculus, like Huygens on optics, like, like Kepler on gravity and optics, and repackaging it turning, it, turning the discovery into mathematical descriptive formula, and then saying, well, let's get, we, we need a person to attribute these things to that we could say had an apple or, or other fruit fall on his head, which caused a discovery. And, and then we'll create a new sort of deity, a modern um, secular uh, god under a new pantheon of the Enlightenment, which itself was, you know, a, co a con very controlled political operation. So this is what the empire does. Either destroy the discovery before it can be made, kill the discoverer before you can translate the discovery to other people. Or if you can't do other th those two things, try to own the discovery, co-opt it, and then subvert it later on if possible like you know wait fight another day and they burn things like the library of alexandria like the the empire itself i'm sure that there is a lot of really good stuff that could teach us a lot about the library of about the universe in the library of alexandria their commitment re religiously was to bring about a feudal dark age where human beings and cows are effectively the same thing and the masters are the absolute lords of olympus as deities immortals on the mountain and so part of the, the empire is, is something which is really unnatural. They will use and promote science to a point, but they can't really make within their system of, of anti-human hate, <laughs> they can't really generate those types of qualitative leaps that you could get from a Madame Curie or Dmitry Mendeleev or a Max Planck or Einstein or many of the great scientists of the 20th century um, who today we're not even told about. Um, they're, they're not good at generating that. They're good at crushing that and trying to hide it. So I, I have my doubts when I listen to Austin Fitz about the, the level and scope of the, uh, the secret scientific economy. I, I, I have a lot of misgivings and doubts about this thing. Um, Even I think that there are sciences, there yeah. are things that are kept from us, but I don't think it's as advanced as she says personally. Okay. Okay. No, that makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. But what? What if we hypothesize? You know, they they would want to you know create for themselves a parallel you know technological advanced. You know, they believe in all this transhumanism bullshit, and and, and so they want to create in advance uh, a, a parallel society, a parallel civilization with their own technologies, but keep it away from you know from the plebs, from the common. Oh common yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, they want that. Yeah, yeah, they want that. And, and to a certain degree, it's true. Like, they're, you know, these guys are... are this is know, why we need to talk about central banks and the fiat money. You know, how is the control over the money? This is why we, the toxic Bitcoin maximalists, we are so, you know, so obsessed, so convinced that the only solution to all this structural, I mean, madness is 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 the money itself we need to decentralize it make it incorruptible and you know more and more people are waking up to the fact that the bitcoin that's why we are so obsessed with bitcoin because bitcoin is the only money you know that is incorruptible it's math and code is decentralized it is it is uninflatable there are only 21 million bitcoin uh, there no one can control it it, un it is unconfiscatable and you can build layers on it now it's being used as a medium of exchange you know what i'm saying like once we go once we once uh, a critical uh, a tipping point a mass of the people it can be you know maybe it's right now 100 200 million people but once we reach a billion people i think there will come this acceleration of of of, of you know ma not only we don't need like the mass adoption what we need is a, like a critical mass within three five or ten percent of the earth's population like just as Buckminster Fuller said, you know, don't don't try you you know to I'm not just paraphrasing you know don't try to like transform the structure from within, but just you know create a new structure and the old one becomes obsolete. And I think this is what we are heading to. What do you think? Well, um, okay, so there's two things uh, about the parallel uh, the parallel uh, system and and then what you're saying about banking Bitcoin. Um, so in terms of um, when when you listen to people like um, Yuval Harari or um, or many of the the creepy the creepy ideologues speaking at the World Economic Forum um, events, 
um, yeah, you get a sense that these guys are very much themselves uh, committed to um, a transhumanistic religion whereby in the year, whatever it is, some, some say 2050, um, as far as their dogma is concerned, we will achieve a, a singularity point. That's what Ray Kurzweil um, calls it, the, the Google um, CEO or lead engineer. Um, there's different names given to this thing, but yeah, their view is that ultimately there is no pattern of purpose in nature except random natural selection until now. At that moment, the elite amongst human beings will become the natural selectors, whereby humans and machines merge, brains and, and machine merge, genetic, you know, CRISPR type of technology will give us the tools to direct the evolution of the species into desirable pathways. And if you want to know what those things look like in their minds, look, just read uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Yeah, I read it. Yeah. So they want to become immortal. I mean, you know, in a sense, through... I, I think so. I, with... I, think, I, I think that that's where there's this obsession with, um, you know, like, look, people like <laughs> Walt Disney and, and others, uh, they got cryogenically frozen, right? I mean, this has been an ongoing thing where these guys are ultimately afraid still of their mortality. Um, the, the thing about human beings is like, we're all going to die. We're the only species that's self-aware of our mortality. But the choice then we have is to situate our identities and the time that we use in the gift that, that was given to us in this material world as being, um, do we, do we do, is our identity tied to the health of our soul, our connection to the infinite cosmos, the, the divinity of creation, our, our great-grandchildren, and those unborn and those past, is that how we situate our, ourselves? Because when we do, what you find in characters in, in, throughout history who, who exhibit that type of integrated personality types, they tend to not to really be that afraid of death. In fact, they welcome it if, if the health of their souls is going to be maintained by bodily uh, pain. Um, those are not very predictable predictable people according to a social engineer they won't they won't just adapt to a hive uh, or a you know a herd that's controlled and and so the empire imperialists despise those personality types listen to martin luther king jr's uh, speeches from the mountaintops and you, you'll get it the very three days before he dies and you'll get a sense of of what this is right just listen to these things on youtube um i'm talking to your audience right now uh <laughs> But seriously, if you're listening to this this podcast, go and Google notes. Martin Luther King speeches and listen to From the Mountaintop. Just listen and, and take it in. Um, the, 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 they themselves, the oligarchy, are so uh, obsessed with their hedonistic side of themselves, right? This is why a lot of them are just so degenerate to a degree which is very uncomfortable. We see this with the Epstein stuff. We see this with Pizzagate. We see this all. It's, it's the level of perversion uh, embedded in the higher echelons of the elite are very disturbing. And, uh, and they're so, their identities are so immersed with this uh, hedonism as well as the loyalty to the class that they're a part of um, that I think like they're so afraid of death that they have created a, a whole religion around. That's what transhumanism I think is, 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 is masquerading behind is an illusion that they can cheat death. They can be the gods of Olympus that are the immortals above the mortals. And, you know, whether it's uploading your brain to a, a cloud uh, <laughs> that, that beats the laws of entropy or whatever, you know, just constantly uh, downloading your, your mainframe into, a, into a, a, hard, a, a hard drive that you re-upload to a new body, whatever. They, they got all these like... Like, like Neuralink and this whole Neuralink, obsession yeah. by Elon now, Musk. Personally, I think this is... Yeah. unscientific creepy hullabaloo i don't i don't think there's any real science in it although they might religiously believe it i don't think that they have i think that they're nuts i, I think this is crazy as fuck um but <clears throat> the um they they do have things like islands that they're buying underground uh manors and mansions that are integrated in you know uh yeah, I don't. I don't believe that that we have a parallel society on Mars that's been created. I've seen no evidence for that, though. Though Austin Fitz says so, I, I've not seen. Give me evidence. I've not seen it except for very, very flaky evidence, which is not. I don't. I don't 
build my my convictions around. No, we don't even have to go far that far, like Mars. Like, what about like what about on this planet? Like, do they, do you think they have underground? I don't know. You know. Well, I just said so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they have they've got all sorts of things that you know for contingencies of a nuclear war or uh, or things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, as I said, they ultimately every time I've seen this is why being working on universal history is so valuable. And, and for me, it, I, I always refer back to the, um, the knowledge of history that, that, that we know of what happens when the oligarchy gets their way, whenever they achieve what they want and they get their maximum degree of real control over the system. And the system ultimately is corrupted to, it's like a parasite latching on a host, right? When this type of parasite achieves its desires from the Roman empire system, when, when Rome, was once a republic and and the republicans like cicero were assassinated and ultimately it became an empire or before that when uh greece you know greece uh under its republican movements of solon uh lasted a very short period of time the the good and uh and after they killed socrates um and assassinated many of socrates disciples around plato later on uh, that society had completely given up the means, the, the moral fitness to survive. And it became an empire under Pericles. It started backstabbing its allies. It, it became more usurious, more rapacious. And um, it, it, it dissolved. It lost the ability to maintain itself and it collapsed. Now, in the case of the Roman Empire collapsing in 400 to 450 AD, did the oligarchy that had maintained control of the different controlled licensed cults and the banking system and everything did they benefit by the collapse of rome no they didn't benefit by that they didn't the, the oligarchy of, of of greece that ran the temples of delphi and these other different cults did they benefit which were also by the way the banks of the day as well funding all sides of the <laughs> the conflicts did they benefit when the, when uh, greece went into hell no they didn't benefit so what i'm seeing is a tendency to um self-destruct ultimately, based on a certain unwillingness to break with illusions about what your ideal utopia could be. It's never that good. Whenever society does go into a collapse, even in the, in the 13th century dark age uh, that killed like a third of Europe, that was done by a banking collapse, right? There was a bubble, a speculative bubble built up by the house of Bardi and Peruzzi, uh, which was defaulted by a, a British king who couldn't pay like the, what he owed for, uh, for wool at a certain point. It, it set into, into motion a chain reaction of defaults that resulted in these big immutable banking houses collapsing, a breakdown of trade, a breakdown of economic affairs and of sanitation, other things. And for a very long time, it was effectively a dark age. And I got to say, when I look at the, again, the role, the lifestyle of the elite, the rich and famous, <laughs> they didn't benefit. They didn't. They, they, they will try to, you know, um, I think today, this is the irony, the self-contradiction of empire is that they like electricity. They like soap. They like running water. You know, I don't think Bill Gates or I don't even want to attribute Bill Gates to having real power, but you know, I, I don't think these guys would want to, to do without those things, but nothing from within the system that they are loyal to could create those things, let alone bring them online as forms of, uh, the productive process for humanity. So they have nothing in that sense. They can only destroy, they can't create, and they live by their own illusions. So I don't think that uh, their illusions, their their utopia can work. Um, I do think, though, that we do have, because they are insane, criminally insane, and they have power to carry out their ideas, we are in danger of going into either a nuclear war or a prolonged dark age, the, the forgetting of the past accomplishments of, of society. That's a possibility. Um, and as far as the only viable resistance that I see on the earth today to this supranational financier oligarchy, I only see serious resistance coming out of, I, I alluded to this at, at the beginning, um, to the greater Eurasian partnership, or sometimes otherwise known as the um, multipolar alliance of sovereign nation states saying that we will not uh, be sacrificed on the altar of Gaia. That's why, you know, the, the heads of state of China, of Russia, of India, of uh, Brazil, even uh, Turkey, has all said that they're not going to participate in the COP26 summit that just began yesterday. They're not going to participate. Because it, they know it's suicide. I mean, they know it's suicide. They know it's, they know it's a would it's, start, you know, I mean, just going into total slavery and famine and, and, and poverty and, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's a controlled, uh, it's a controlled big, big culling of the herd. 
and uh, like the, you need to wield the power. This is the, the 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 sovereign nation state has been a target of destruction for a long time because the sovereign nation state was not created. Some people would would say there's this this uh, myth that the empire gave us sovereign nation states to better control us. So the these are people who say the revolution of 1776 was a giant fraud given to the people by the British Empire that wanted to give them the illusion of freedom, but really never having the reality of any chance in hell of having real freedom. And so they gave us the illusion, but really to better control the slaves. That's why nation states exist. And all everybody is a part of it. China, Russia, India, the USA, Britain, they're all equal parts of the same game. And to be smart, to be wise, you have to realize that everybody is controlled. All you can do is disengage and look out for number one, look out for your immediate family and, and think small, go local, get off the grid. Exactly, and yeah. This frankly, I think that, that that's that a trap. cannot be emphasized enough. The, you know, back to the roots, local economy, circular economies. And, you know, especially when you have, you know, again, back to money, to the root of it, to the essence. Uh, once you have, you know, deflationary money, you know, that's why I would love you to have a discussion with, with Jeff what? Booth, the author of uh, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to Abundant Future. Because once you have a deflationary money, my, my, my point you have is more though, innovation, is the... more products, more services, yeah. cheaper and more, you know, advanced technologies and more prosperity and abundance for everybody then, you know, equal opportunity. But, but Kevin, the one point that I think we're, I want to emphasize though, is I think that that is a fraud. The idea of disengaging and going local yeah. is a fraud that has gotten us into a trap that we're falling for to go into the slaughterhouse because only sovereign nation states have the power to fight this oligarchy, which if we all fall for this program of disengaging and going local, then we will be so divided that we could be even more easily conquered because the 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 energy supplies, the the infrastructure that exists that we all use when we open up our tap the hydroelectric dams and nuclear power state that we use when we, we have fridge our, our fridges that keep food cold. Um, all of these things are, um, they're maintained by a system of macro structures beyond our local mini environments, which were created by sovereign nation states before we were born. And now they've been dismantled and there's an attack to kill us, to reduce our population by getting us to divide ourselves. But Russia and China are able to fight back, especially China, because they've maintained control of a strong central government that is a weapon that can you that is being used to fight against the depopulation fanatics in the city of london and wall street uh -huh, so that's, yep. that's why they're they're strong is because they've unlike us we gave up our our central government powers back when jfk was killed and bobby kennedy was killed and we allowed ourselves to to go into a you know a, a, a libertarian type of each against all modality no national involvement in anything good. Nations just became used as appendages of an empire, right? As tools to, to crush us. That's been the last 40 years of our experience. In China, they fought back against that in the 1980s. They, they said, no, we're not going to privatize our central banking system. We're going to keep it nationalized. And that's why they're able to build big things today. They can admit, you know, large scale credit for big infrastructure that, that elevates people from poverty, a hundred, a billion people so far. And they're able to, to create alternative banking systems like the AIIB and, and the BRICS Development Bank and, and other things that are outside of the control of the, the cage, the international financier cage. So I think for me, when I look at Trump, the biggest threat that Trump posed before the coup d'etat, are you aware that it was a coup d'etat in the United States that overthrew Trump? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, good. The, the facts the, speak for themselves. I mean, but you know, it's the the, the thing that people controversial. But yeah. No, no, it's you could yeah, it can be proven. You, people can bring this to the bank. Um, but it was a coup run by uh, the deep state that had been trying to use things like Russia Gate for four years to yeah. overthrow Trump. The thing that scared them about Trump was both that he was reviving a national federal uh, program that was last seen with John John F. Kennedy of national protectionism, like you have to have a strong nation state that can put protectionism to defend the nation's industrial agricultural base to revive Michigan, to revive the, the Rust Belt. But he was doing it while also uh, making calls and, and working with the Russians and the Chinese for development to create a US, China, Russia grouping of nation states 
which together could rebuild society uh, together and end the wars. And he even, you know, he invited the, the vice premier of China to the White House in uh, May of 2019. And he gave a speech saying, like, look, Russia, China, the U.S. are building all these nuclear bombs. We're putting all of these billions of dollars. We could instead be built using our money to build the world together. And and he did this outside of the control of any of the uh, the perception managers around the White House. And he got Xi Jinping, who he, he went with Melania to the Forbidden City, and they spent uh, a day as as honored guests alone with Xi Jinping organizing an agreement which was vital for the survival of the world, um, which could, I mean, under Biden, it's not going to happen. But all that to say, that it was a Russia-US trade agreement, which went into effect on January 2020, whereby China was going to buy, for um, in the first phase, $350 billion of US productive finished goods from revived US industries that were going to go towards the Chinese growth market. And it would be a multi-phase process where it would be win-win cooperation. And increasingly, also, Trump was reorganizing the U.S. military, extracting it from the CIA, and also forcing the military to start cooperating with Russia in the Middle East, in, in Syria and in Iraq, um, or Syria. So <clears throat> there was, this is the thing that scared when George Soros came out of Davos in, in January 22nd, 2020, and George Soros said the two greatest threats to my open society are, are Donald Trump's USA and Xi Jinping's China. That's what he was afraid of, was this uh, motion towards cooperation, because these three sovereign nation states could together have the power to break the oligarchy, because you have to break the oligarchy. You can't live within the oligarchy's game. Otherwise, you can't win in that game. You, you will die you will die. Your family, everybody will die if you try to play by the oligarchy's rules. So you got to break the oligarchy. And that's what <laughs> that's what COVID-19, when that was sprung onto the world a few months later. I mean, it, when, when Soros gave the speech, COVID was still, it had just begun, but Trump was still pro-China. It was only months later that they were able to change Trump's perception of things adequately to get him to think that the enemy of the US and of COVID everything was was china that he was fooled china actually wants to destroy the u.s ha, ha, ha. that fucked everything up um and then trump took on a stupider tone when it came to foreign policy but despite that i still think that he represents he, he's a human being i could recognize humanity there and i recognize a fighting spirit and i think that that could still feasibly be a pathway of of fight that could still save salvage the u.s and bring it into this alliance but the system is going to blow up so the current banking system is going to blow. That that's programmed into the system from 1971 is a blowout. Okay, Matthew. So yeah. listen, I mean, I think we need definitely an in-depth, separate discussion when it comes mm. to the nation state, because you know, before we start recording, you know, we talked about like how corrupt the judicial system is, is also especially in Germany, as you know, Ryan Fulmich also said, and it's everywhere. You know, I mean, where's the separation of powers? I mean. And it, everything has been co-opted. You know, all, look at the, all these politicians that are in, in, in positions of power, who are the disciples of Klaus Schwab's WEF young global leaders, even the ex-chancellor who, who's got kicked out, who resigned because of corruption and, and, and criminal charges uh, just recently. So all these people with the you know, European Union, Austria, France, uh, all kinds of countries, they're like not hundreds, but thousands of these disciples everywhere in these positions of power. So. I'm not sure, you know, uh, where to go. And, you know, uh, just just uh, for the listeners uh, to uh, remind ourselves where we are right now, uh, Mr. Prince Charles uh, <laughs> claims a vast military style campaign is required to marshal a fundamental economic transition. These are the guys who fly in with, uh, you know, not only private jets, but dozens of armored SUVs and, you know, and all kinds of, you know, <laughs> vehicles. And, and trying, you know, in contempt, I mean, what's the word for it? In contempt and, 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 and in hatred for humanity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this yeah, is... Yeah, Biden had like an 85 car they? cavalcade or something. Huh? Biden had like an 85 SUV cavalcade. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but where is this going, Matthew? I mean, we, I, we well, have a different discussion, I think, on this one, you know? Like, like where do you see, like, money, the monetary, you know, uh, root solution? Uh, do you okay, see... Okay, well, here's the thing. Like, um, the, the, the system itself... Uh, okay, the, the oligarchy themselves managing 
um, this whole COP26 Great Reset crap, they themselves don't believe, obviously, they, they, they don't believe that human beings are actually causing global warming. They don't care about protecting nature at all. They only care about depopulation and population control. That's, that's their only concern, right? And, uh, and you can see people like, like, you know, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who recently, well, he died in 2005 or four. Um, he was renowned for going with his buddy, Prince Philip, on saring, you know, safari killing white rhinoceroses and other endangered species. But yet they were the founders of the World Wildlife Fund for Nature and the modern conservation movement. No, I'm sorry. You don't care about, you don't care about nature. Um, so on the one hand, yes, it's total hypocrisy. On the other hand, um, the corruption that they've created in the system is endemic, as we've talked about. Yeah, you, you know, all across Europe, all across the US, you have po highly positioned influencers within governments, within academia, within the media. Now, Executive, judicial, I mean, legislative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Judges, um, heavily corrupted. Now, does that mean that everybody is in on the conspiracy? No, 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 not at all. But it does mean, though, that you have highly well-positioned people who are aware of what they're a part of, and they shape an environment of fear, intimidation, and groupthink. Now, it doesn't mean everybody who, who is within the group thinks that way, but their behavior has to accommodate because they're kind of cowardly or they don't think that they have any chance of doing anything if they speak up except die. They will tend to adapt to the controlled environment. This came out of MK Ultra studies, Tavistock studies throughout the 1940s, 50s, 60s um, on, on group psychology. So this is like, there's a certain science to this. Now, most people, if you gave them the opportunity to not do or be an instrument for evil, they would tend to, to do that instead. They would tend to. I've got many examples. I'm not going to go through them right now, but there's many examples directly. I think one more clear-cut case study was when Donald Trump did win the uh, 2016 elections, what you, what you saw, people are like, how did that happen? Was it just like the, um, like there were all sorts of conspiracy theories around QAnon that promoted the idea that, you know, there was this Bobby, Ken Robert Kennedy was actually not dead, but has been running an international white hat, good deep state this whole time waiting to save the world and everything is part of the plan. Uh, no, that was a psyop. That was a psyop. That's not true. But what? But it, but it was inexplicable for so many people. And why? Because they don't actually get the fact that people, there, there are many highly positioned people who don't want to be a part of ending civilization. And when they saw the opportunity of not playing that kind of role and, and instead playing something that involved them both making money while at the same time not destroying the world, they took advantage and helped that process. That you saw that in the private sector, CEOs of many oil companies, uh, construction companies that had played not such a good role in the past 40 years. You know, people were who had been scumbags ended up um, acting in a better way around Trump um, it, within government too, within the intelligence agencies. Um, we saw examples, for example, in um, why didn't we bomb Iran in 2007 when Dick Cheney was, all of the propaganda was in place to prepare the mindset for the bombing of Iran in 2007, because they were built, they were on the verge, we were told of a new nuclear weapon that they were gonna immediately use to destroy Israel. Why didn't we do it? We didn't do it because a national intelligence estimate report came out the moment Dick Cheney was in for heart surgery. Yes, somehow he still had a heart, I don't know how. <laughs> but the second he was in surgery, the uh, certain people working within the CIA produced a national intelligence estimate that they made public. They made sure that every core media agency got it and it, it went public that proved that there, that Iran had let go of any nuclear weapons program already many years earlier. And there was no, there was no evidence to back up Cheney's uh, claims. So you have people who are human beings in a myriad of places and who would adapt if they saw that there was some, um, some leadership, some fight. And I don't know where that breaking point is. I don't have a, a mathematical threshold point of 3% for, I don't know. But I saw an example of that with Trump. And, and since then, there's been an attempt to try to, you know, relabel everybody who is pro-Trump as domestic terrorists or whatever else, right? Um, <clears throat> to try to, like, intimidate people to basically forget that that ever happened. <laughs> That's basically the thing. Forget that. Because if people actually think about it, it can happen again. Um, and I, I don't. I don't have a, a pure solution, but I know that that's the type of, of action 
it, the, the character of the positive change that has to happen has to take that type of form whereby people can be given courage with, if you're a judge, if you're a lawyer, if you're uh, working in a government bureaucracy as a civil servant. You, you, there has to be a situation created whereby you have the courage to break from your expected mode of behavior and do what your conscience compels you. Um, people would tend to do that. So, I mean, I wish I had a, a comforting direct answer for a lot of this. And, and as far as Bitcoin is concerned, I got to say, like, the system itself will blow out. Like, I, I, it's a fact yeah, that the current yeah. derivative Let's bubble talk about system some numbers, is... Matthew. Let's talk uh -huh. about some numbers. We've got global debt in the range of pro approximately near $300 trillion. Yeah. Without the unfunded liability, if you include the unfunded liabilities and, you know, yeah. all this, you know, Social Security unfunded liabilities, you come to an astronomical mind-boggling number of, I think, two quadrillion. And the, I think 30... Are you talking about derivatives and every, everything associated everything, with derivatives? Everything, even the derivatives yeah. included. So, yeah. and then the, what is it, like 30 or 40% of all US dollars created out of thin air uh, have been printed like in the last few years, like a couple of, like few years, let's just say. And I mean, the numbers are just, are just mind boggling. It's, you know, I mean, and, and hyperinflation, the word hyperinflation has become even on vogue, like modern, like trendy, even Jack Doors of Twitter, you know, like hype, you, people can feel the pain now, you know, that's why people are going to be, be, they're going to wake up more and more people exponentially going to wake up. They're going to, you know, where are they going to escape, so, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I, I, like, I see that, um, this is, this is unavoidable, the, the blowout, the hyperinflationary blow, because it's programmed into the system. There, there's a certain amount of free will embedded in the system, but only a certain amount of free will. You can only push this for so long. Uh, there's enough triggers where there's, there's multiple points where you could easily just trigger um, the chain reaction blowout that would result in, it's a bit of a combination of both the 1929 Great Depression uh, bubble popping, and, and because you had, in 1929, it was different from 1923, Germany whereby in, in 29, it was more, you know, broker call loans that were far outpacing the means of paying those broker call loans back. So there was a certain, there was a speculative overvaluation of the system that was then uh, deleveraged and you went into an, inf um, an, um, uh, an anti-inflationary crisis. Uh, goods fell far below the means for farmers to maintain their farms because they couldn't get the cost of production when they sold their goods. Um, that was the problem then, but, and in the case of, of Weimar hyperinflation, it was a bit opposite. It wasn't so much, it, there was some speculation, but, it, but the big problem was just money printing to pay unpayable Versailles debts, right? Yeah. We have like a similar situation to the forties. I think there's more of like a fiscal deficit now going on more like peril. Well, it's like, a bit of, it's something anyway. new in the sense that it's a bit of a hybrid of a variety yeah. of dynamics. Definitely. Um, so we do have the unavoidable deleveraging of the system, but at the same time, we have the money printing uh, infusing capital liquidity into the system that is devalued, that is going to unleash the hyperinflation. So we have a bit of both, which is really bad. And most importantly, just like 1929 US or in the 1930s, USA, 33, uh, or Germany, 1923, the similarity to today, which is worse today, is the breakdown of the physical economy. The, the industrial output has shrunk. It's been atrophied. So the, 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 the thing that we need the, the 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 qualitative production of of agriculture the the uh infrastructure grids that we should have been maintaining and improving upon for the past 40 years we've done none of that it's all decayed grossly um and the green new deal uh infrastructure uh spending bill is not real infrastructure for the most part that is part of the uh depopulation thing because uh, windmills and solar panels that is not infrastructure that that might make work happen but the quality of energy you're going to get from that is so shit that you will not be able to sustain yeah let alone uh, the the environmental pollution on top of the, the environmental stuff it's mine yeah i mean oh, yeah. it's no bad on so many levels. energy and so, resources yeah yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> the real the real crisis is the loss of means of sustaining our in the U.S. case, 300 plus billion, uh, million people. We got 8 billion soon on the earth um, as a whole. So the real value is not in the money. It's in the means of sustaining and improving upon the life of the people who live in the reality of physical space-time. The money is a tool that we create. The rules of the money system can vary. 
the point is the thing that must make the behavior of the money, whether we're talking about in the post in the post uh, globalized order after the blowout, which I hope will take a certain form. Um, the, 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 the question is, what will be the purpose of whatever the money is? So if we have it, I think that blockchain and Bitcoin could play a very important role in whatever that, po- that system looks like. But the point is, it has to abide by certain discoverable principles of natural law for it to have any real intrinsic value. It's not because people want the money or the Bitcoin that, that the Bitcoin has the money. No, but it has to have fundamental monetary properties, which is, again, incorruptible, unconfiscatable, uninflatable, you know, uh, not uh, not controllable by anyone. You can actually control everyone who has a node can verify you verify your own transactions. I think we need a, a separate discussion, Matthew, on this, because I think, uh, you know, if we don't if we do not resolve this, on a on a root level which is the money the you know we need hard sound money that's why you know under the gold standard there were you know zero to one technology there was abundance there was prosperity people there was also able mm, to save money you know yeah but but under the gold standard you also had imperialism you had you had destruction of lives yeah Um, it's it's a it's um it's an element of but it's not the cause of your society's health like so you gotta give everything its proper place and I, I think the same thing, everything can be corrupted if you have a global empire. Bitcoin can be as equally misused and corrupted as, as anything else can be in that mm, system of empire. I disagree uh, on this one, uh, Matthew. Shut we, down our food production. I think like, we really you know, need like, a, 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 a principal discussion on this. I would really encourage you to, uh, you know, maybe together with, uh, you know, someone who can who can explain to you maybe also the, the technological, if you want to, like, you're really curious, but I think it's no, more No, 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 dude, I, I got some, I got some Bitcoin. Like, don't, don't yeah, get me wrong. I've, I've, I've got some Bitcoin. I'm, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> anti-Bitcoin, okay? I'm just saying that there's something um, fundamentally, like, if, if energy, which comes from hydroelectric grids, powers power stations like that's part of our life that we live in the water systems the food production systems these are all the reality and the monetary system is a, is may or may not be something that is connected and sustains those things um i am just saying that whatever the characteristic and i think like i said blockchain and bitcoin could play a, a very and should play a very important part of a healthy system but it should be based upon certain things like national banking that's run by sovereign nation states that are not beholden to a private financier interest that wants to kill us. I, 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 I see that as a, as a domain, which I know that you, you don't see that as a domain. I do. No, as, banks like uh, local uh, banks, like regional banks. I mean, that's why the CBDCs are, are, are the agenda of the central. No, I don't mean, I don't mean regional. Make, I, I mean, every national bank, obsolete. every national bank should have regional uh, branches of it, but it shouldn't be just a, a highly diffused system of divide to conquer. If you have local control systems of local banking, local things with no um, unified nation, you are divided to be easily conquered and brought into a brave new world type of situation um, to be played against each other. Like Netflix movies <laughs> uh, condition us to think, you know, how do you, how do you survive in the, the post-war age or the post, you know, the, the dystopic age of like now just get by whether it's there's so many of these these shows and movies right uh walking dead is a big one or is it called yeah it's called walking dead right that's the one everyone watches i think Uh, i'm not sure yeah but there's a lot of this programming but like what do you what do you do now that the civilization has ended and how do you just like maximize your your own well-being with your like little local group of family and maybe friends you trust against other groups of marauders or that are that are that are out to for their survival and will occasionally kill you in the, the walking dead world. Right. Of So that's game theory. That's video game theory, uh, which has been animating the cold war. And, and if we play by the rules of their game of, of like, look out for yourself and f- we're, we're, we can't win. It's like walking into a casino and thinking you can beat the casino. You might win occasionally and get lucky at craps, but if you do this systemically as a way of life, the casino will always win. The rules of the game are ultimately those kinds of rules are controlled. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, listen. I mean, um, you know, first of all, uh, we, we, I'm also only talking about Bitcoin. You know, not not about you know some virtual silicon buzzwords like blockchain and shit coins and altcoins and all this bullshit. It's it, we've a lot of us have been through this journey for many years now. But uh, once you understand, I think it's really important. And and I, I actually contacted Peter Young, who works for. Uh, 
uh, to get in touch with you, uh, who works also for Safeta Namus, the author of the Bitcoin Standard. It was an eye-opener and enlightenment book for, for so many people who, whether you're Austrian economies or familiar with Austrian economics or hard money or what is money, you know, what is, you know, uh, and, and the fundamental monetary properties of Bitcoin. And, and, and he actually, you know, j you know, uh, accompanies you through this journey of, you know, of, 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 of the origins of money, of the gold standard. And then eventually he talks about Bitcoin. That's why I think it's really important we understand like w what are the fundamental principles of Austrian economics. And um, I, I would really, you know, welcome you, encourage you to have a discussion. Is he, is he, is he an Austrian economist? He's an Austrian economist, yeah, yeah. Okay, the, the Austrian economists come out of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an imperial um, school of thinking that comes out of Karl Menger, who worked, he was the retainer for uh, yeah. the, Habsburg, the Habsburg Empire. It was one of the most evil satanic empires in the world that Karl Menger was a teacher of the, uh, the, um, the Habsburgs as a whole, um, yeah. who founded a school to repackage Adam Smith, because Adam Smith himself was like Newton. He was a, a he yeah. worked for the British East India Company as a way to, dis he created theories under the wealth of nations to justify the destruction of the United States in the year early years of its revolution mm -hmm. to say, we don't need protectionism we should just go for you know lowest prices of the law cash cropping and that was what adam smith was deployed by the british empire to create a theory kind of like darwin was done to, yeah. to do the same thing in biology well what about what, what about mises like okay Karl Menger is one of the origins Me of about mises hayek yeah. rothman no, the, no uh friedrich von hayek and von mises were parts of a uh, the same operation run at the end of world war ii as students of Menger to justify the dissolution of nation states by saying that we need to uh, have every that everybody's freedom is located in their personal hedonistic impulses to maximize their personal um, gain and minimize their 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 pain. Um, and we should build that was that was pure Smith, but repackaged a little bit. So the Austrian school, school is Smith, uh, but repackaged and tweaked and refined under the the needs of the the, the Habsburgs. Um, which, if you think about it, what was the Habsburg, what was Menger, and, and also von Mises, what were they really afraid of? The dominant dynamic amongst the Austrian and German uh, statesmen was Abraham Lincoln's system of protectionism, rail building, national credit through the greenbacks and that, that was being deployed by Otto von Bismarck. And in Germany and in, in Russia and in Austria, the, the leading figure was Frederick List. Fried, uh, as a German speaker, what you'd say is Friedrich List. And List was somebody who was a, a beautiful, fantastic person who studied in, in the United States. He studied Alexander Hamilton's system of, of, the, of what was called, he gave the name, the, the American system of political economy, which was not Marxism. It was, it was not free trade. It was, it was none of those things today that we're told we have to fit as a category into. It's, not, it's none of those things. It was different. But it was based on the idea that the human mind is the source of value, that the human mind is the resource that creates resources, and that all economic activity have to be, has to be governed by the enhancement of that society's ability to create new discoveries, translate them into new technologies, and apply them for the productive process that leaps, that breaks the Malthusian limits, limits uh, formula. That was what Frederick List was all about. And that was spreading across the world from 1865 all the way up through especially 1903 or so, that was a, the dominant one. And in Germany and in Austria, his ideas were very big amongst groupings like um, the, the, the finance minister, um, Rath, Walter Rathenhaum, who was the German finance minister, who was part of the Frederick List Society in 1922, who was organizing with the Russians and with Warren Harding, the assassinated American president, who died of oysters that like a year later. They were organizing the Rapallo Accords, which would have basically um, ensured no hyperinflation in Germany because it said, we're going to, we're going to cancel all of the war reparations debts from Germany. You don't have to print money. And Russia and Germany together with the help of the USA was going to uh, rebuild all of your manufacturing and your, your heavy industry. And we'll all work together on win-win cooperation using the Frederick List program. The Austrian school that became hegemonic and Ludwig von Mises was an advisor to the Austrian uh, government during the time which called for mass austerity instead of printing money. So <laughs> this is the fraud, right? They, they said, okay, your choice is either print money or cut the budget and wait, you know, maybe it'll sort itself out the markets, you know? 
Um, both of those two solutions were both death. They were both, and that they knew that they were death. John Maynard Keynes pushed one of, and 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 uh, the von Mises pushed the other one. And von Mises says, "Oh, that was the greatest thing I did for the the Austrians. That I helped them avoid the hyperinflation of Weimar." Yeah, but you cut the budget massively. You destroyed standards of life. You could measure the living standards collapse by your austerity every single month to month. You destroyed everything. And then you made them very susceptible to uh, fascism anyway. Um, now, Frederick von Hayek, who was his lead student, was used in the London School of Economics. He was a teacher, the same school that Karl Popper. I told you about Karl Popper, right? Uh, that was a Fabian Society school. And they created a false debate between John Maynard Keynes and Frederick von Hayek. It was a London School of Economics sponsored debate along with the Bank of England in 1932 around what, um, what's the best way to deal with the Great Depression? Do you cut the budget the way, you know, and, and just try to deregulate things, strip the nations of the right of, of protectionism or state credit, uh, the way the Austrian school is saying, like just laissez faire? Or do you go with the state credit program of, 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 um, uh, Keynes, who is again an evil, satanic, depopulation fanatic. He, he, he was yeah, a, and a fiat, uh, uh, you know, pseudo economist. I mean, he wasn't well, an economist. It was all about you know aggregate spending, and he had to own his own, you know, well, his, artificial. His theories were all theory. designed. He was a he was the head of the the Malthusian League. Um, he was a eugenicist. He was part of the British Eugenic Society with Julian Huxley. Um, now. He, and, and also he was a Cambridge apostle. That's very important as well, as was Bertrand Russell. Um, the, the debate between the two of them was like, okay, state, the state control of the system to emit credit to just make, make work happen. And maybe magically it will create, um, it'll give people paychecks who dig holes and another person will like to refill a hole and both people will get paychecks and they're going to want to spend their paychecks. And then the, the, the spending is going to create a demand, which will then induce, uh, industries that are currently inactive to become activated and the industries are going to need electricity to 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 because industrial production needs a lot of electricity and water and then that that's going to create a new demand to, to make capital budgeting uh build infrastructure and it was very bottom up it was the inversion of reality it was never real and it never works that way um but this debate between these two guys who actually were friends okay <laughs> uh was either no state, every individual to themselves, and things will just magically work themselves out by the invisible hands of the marketplace, by, you know, or no individuality, pure state, and everything will magically work itself out. Um, the thing that they were both designed as a false dichotomy to, that, that was being created to brainwash the, the masses was that in the United States at that same time, you had the reactivation of the Abraham Lincoln Frederick List American System School organizing themselves around um, a black horse candidate or a dark horse candidate who's never supposed to win named Franklin Roosevelt, who was the only anti-fascist who said, we're not going to accept eugenics. We're not going to accept fascism as the solution to the economic crises of the Great Depression. And he went to war with the, Lon I mean, you had um, the international London bankers who were trying to create a great reset conference of 1933 to get rid of nation states and say, we need central banks to be in control of the world order as the great solution. He went to war and he sabotaged for six months. He sabotaged that conference and pulled the U.S. out of all agreements and forced the King of England to say, well, I guess nothing's going to happen now. We'll try another day. And he went to war at the same time with Wall Street banks. He brought J.P. Morgan to trial and forced them to admit how they manufactured the Great Depression. And, you know, he fought against, he, he avoided two assassination attempts and a coup d'etat being funded by the J.P. Morgan networks that were tied to London. So FDR was on a multi-level fight, reviving protectionism, state credit for large-scale projects that were tied to real productivity, not just make work. It was not Keynesian. And we've been told a lie, which was that FDR was a Keynesian. Bullshit. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, called FDR an economic incompetent. And FDR, on record to Francis Perkins, his, uh, his secretary, um, said that Keynes is a uh, is not an economist, but a mathematician with with uh, uh, fetishes for and statistics. Statistics. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what FDR was actually doing is not categorizable by either capitalism or communism or socialism. It was none of those things that were told. We have been given these false categories to read our history from, because the history reads the future. 
if we if we what we think of what happened in our past is what shapes our future, then our our options are going to be limited by that knowledge. So this is what JFK also tried to reactivate and did reactivate was this American system of Frederick List, of, of Lincoln, of Hamilton, which is nobody reads this in school. It's been banished from universities. And the Austrian school was designed specifically on the part of those who are running things like the pan-European uh, union, the fascist pan-European movement, um, the, the Otto von Habsburg black nobility, that inner oligarchy. That's what they were trying to do was to say nation states have no fundamental role to play in the uh, governing of your economic orientation and only personal hedonism is freedom. Freedom is not your yeah, ability to align okay. your personal identity with the well-being of your society, which is the way you have real freedom as a, as a real citizen is to be both. You know, I look I mean, out for my listen, family, I look out for my well-being. I mean, I've read some books of Austrian economists and and because, you know, through Safed and Amus, uh, you know, I read then Hoppe and, 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 and Hayek a little bit, uh, Rothbard. I mean, I didn't go like to historical like Menger and Mises, but I think the the issue is here. The point is like to make the the fiat central banking system obsolete, to to go back to individual sovereign sovereignty, you know, and 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 have a sound you know money again, a hard sound money to monetary system, and that's why you know we are such huge fans and 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 believers and 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 comprehend you know the the fundamental monetary properties of Bitcoin, which can you know uh, decentralize centralize these these structures that we have been talking now you know in the last um two hours and well I, I i like i mean i was very attracted to like anthony p sutton or murray rothbard um for a long time um because they do speak out against the private central bankers in this international financier oligarchy so it's very attractive but by being by having a libertarian filter on everything it presumes that your freedom, your sovereignty is located in getting rid of protectionism and having absolute liberalized free markets, which is the cause of freedom. And the reality is that free markets, free trade is never was always anti-freedom because people like Adam Smith, who deployed it uh, on behalf of the British Empire or Karl Menger later on, were always beholden themselves to the oligarchical networks of, of, of Europe that wanted to get rid of, undo the American uh, experience of the Republican Revolution of 1776, get rid of nation states that could have economic sovereignty and have national banks that were, that were run by the interests of the state and not by this private uh, financier oligarchy, which is a cult of Satanists that want to kill us. So the, the, the speaking about the evil is one thing and it's good, but to actually have the means to practically carry out the fight to destroy the evil requires national banks. To have sovereignty requires national economic sovereignty. Yeah. But have Matthew, you have to have a, a national have plan. To, what if we don't have to destroy them? It's not about like, it's a waste of energy and resources. No, I, I mean, okay, to destroy break, them. I think we okay, need- Okay, how about this? How about this? You know? break, up their, break up their power structures because right. under the current situation- but that's only you possible when we detach ourselves, you know, like build our own decentralized, you know, hard, uh, incorruptible money. And that is, you know, well, the only solution we, we see, you know, from, from our perspectives. Well, China, China's been able to break up a lot of their private financiers. Like, I mean, you know, like the, the oligarchy, which has its, it had huge controls and power structures in China. China, when it has a government that actually doesn't want to sacrifice its people on the altar of a computer model, they were, have been able to consistently carry out um, a, a, an, a, a breaking up like of Evergrande, you know, they took their, their, their multi-billionaire owner of Evergrande and they basically said, okay, you just speculated on something essentially illegally that's like really now uh, destructive to the general welfare. You're going to go, we're going to make sure you can go to jail if you want to, which we can do, or you could just use your entire, all of your money, your hundreds of billions of dollars of personal money, and you're going to put it into your company as part of your, you're going to bail out your own company. And you know, they could do that. You could actually force these psychopaths to modify their behavior or put them in jail, as is, as happened in Russia or in the United or in China. Um, you could break up these multinational uh, organizations that have more power, they think, than than any sovereign government. Um, but you you, can, you have to use the power of of constitutional law to to break up that that type of encrusted blah. China's doing it. Um, Russia's trying to do it. 
But the difference between Russia and China is that Russia, um, they had suffered more. So when Gorbachev and Yeltsin, who were Soros assets, uh, broke up and dissolved the Soviet Union, they created private central banking. They created a, a, a totally liberalized economy that created a private, like a private financier class of oligarchs. That that healing process has not been uh, done in Russia. So they, Russia still has a private central bank. They have the IMF that has a lot of power over their economic destiny, even though militarily, they, they're, it's more the nationalists who are in control of their military and intelligence, which gives them a bit of a ability to push back. Um, China, they kicked out Soros before Soros could get their Gorbachev project in China to be successful uh, in 1989. China was able to kick out Soros. They banned him. They, they, they imprisoned Soros' main operative, who was the head of the Chinese Communist Party in 1989. They imprisoned him for life in his house, house arrest. And they maintained control of their national, um, their actual national mechanics of the banking system that have given them a, a weapon, a very powerful weapon to wield successfully in the battle against the Malthusians. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, if you want to... There's two levels to this, okay? The yeah, system would collapse. Be careful and not you glorify, you know, the, the CCP's Communist Party, you know, regimes, uh, structures of China, because this is, you know, I mean, look at the whole, you know, COVID lockdown agenda and, and everything that's been executed. It yeah, but comes from China, right? Not really. Like, look, China has not, they didn't lock down their whole economy. They did lock down a part of the economy, but they never did mandatory vaccinations and they don't have mRNA vaccines. Right, there. okay. So they, where, where, where we, our federal governments have all become appendages demanding mandatory vaccinations or else we'll ruin your life. Um, and most of these vaccinations are not vaccines. They're mRNA. Exactly. Therapy is, yeah. you know, uh, China and Russia, Sputnik V and the Chinese Sinovac are not mRNA at all. They reject that. And they, every time a local administrator on a municipal level or a provincial level has tried to do mandatory vaccinations in Russia or in China, their federal governments have intervened and said, no, you cannot do that and, and stopped it from happening. Mm -hmm. okay. So the thing about China is that they are, look, we are being told that they are the enemy of the world out to like run the Great Reset and impose one world government. Uh, no, right now, China has a U.S. military encircling their backyard that's been underway for over a decade now with hundreds of U.S. military bases around their Pacific preparing a ballistic missile strike on them. Uh, you've got Russia dealing with the same thing. The, NATO has built up an anti-ballistic missile shield, and it's called full-spectrum dominance. They want to try to intimidate these countries into giving up their sovereignty to a world government, or else we will launch a nuclear war against you. And China has only one base outside of its borders. The USA has 860 military bases. The US has 200 bio, uh, bio uh, weapons facilities outside of the US border, all of it covert black ops, no, right. no transparency. And we are being, and they've done provable work on gain of function, deployment of bioweapons for many years. The U.S. has been caught red-handed again and again and again doing it. And I don't say the U.S. as the nation. I mean this, ol this oligarchy, this deep state, right? I don't mean the nation. Um, whereas China has no history of doing this. And we are being told that the, the, the Wuhan games which had the U.S. military deploying uh, themselves throughout Wuhan in uh, September and in October 2000. It's become obvious now, yeah. I mean, yeah, and we're, we're being told, no, this is all a Chinese conspiracy. No, it's evidence it's like, not overwhelming. I mean, yeah. No, it, it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it, this it, it, is, no, China's being framed. China was being set up the way Russia was being set up under Lee Harvey Oswald going to Russia first before being used as Patsy to kill a JFK. They pre-programmed this to get an association with Fauci giving $600,000 to uh, the Wuhan lab in 2017. And that association is all that's being used to then build an entire argument around Steve Bannon and Epoch Times and all these things that China is the enemy, ignoring every other piece of information that I just said, all of that. <laughs> and on top of the fact that China and Russia together have, have created a survivor's alliance as an alternative viable financial economic security architecture outside of the control of the unipolar deep state that runs the transatlantic zone of influence. So it's, um, there, there are problems, there is a deep state in China, but my point is Xi Jinping is fighting it through his actions, like Jack Ma, motherfucker Jack Ma, right? The guy who is the, the trustee of the World Economic uh, Forum. Where is he? Where is, the, where is this guy? <laughs> He's in his mansion in, um, um, I think it's in Shanghai. 
Is, is he on the I mean, house arrest? Or what's, what's, what's up with this guy? Or I think he's been allowed out of it now, but uh, yeah, I mean, and rightfully so. Like, this guy essentially called for a coup d'etat. I listened to his uh, October 2020 speech um, where he basically got too big for his britches, and he said, yeah. um, we need to get rid of the era of industrial nation states and have, and the Chinese government uh, banking system is all wrong. We need digital currency. Okay, gotcha. We need post-industrial digital currency yeah. for the new age, which is part of the Great Reset. Like this guy, he ah. works with Klaus Schwab. He's a trustee of the World Economic Forum. So there's a lot of these guys who are embedded. They have they're highly. Um, there's a lot of money that was built up in the in the 90s around these these local oligarchs who are part of this deep state function that Xi Jinping has been going to war with since 2012. And we are being given a narrative that's being see, packaged see, by okay, makes Epoch sense. Times and, yeah, and a lot of yeah. these networks. By the way, what I meant, uh, the evidence overwhelming, I meant, you know, the whole Fauci thing coming now to the surface, you know, that there were, you know, there was funding going on and the military industrial, you know, I mean, it's all interconnected with the, not necessarily only with the U.S., but this whole complex of around, you know, the U.S., whatever, Department of Defense or Pentagon or uh uh, bioweapon research programs and stuff like that oh yeah 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 very controlled yeah i would love you know to have a really extended discussion first of all um it would be great if you if if peter young you know who works for safeda namus if he gets in touch with you please if if you get an invitation please go on a talk with safeda <laughs> namus i think you would be a you know excellent complete complete complementary knowledge to, to this whole thing and I think you could just complement one and maybe I don't know maybe even uh, correct some error in your in your in your perspective in your comprehension and maybe, maybe. we can learn I, I've learned a lot now from you and my listeners and and the other one would be Jeff Booth the author of uh, the price of tomorrow why deflation is the key to an abundant future um, if, if if we can get you know you together with, with these people uh, with these uh, you know brilliant really thinkers and and authors and 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 uh okay yeah that would be that would sure. be amazing yeah i'd be down man of course yeah um yeah thanks for uh for you know sharing my contact info with them and and if they reach out i'll be happy to uh to Definitely. chat with them anytime yeah yeah wonderful so matthew where can people find you i love your you know Substack articles your youtube channels uh, uh are you active on twitter where can people find you yeah, any other resources? I, I, I am on Twitter, but I'm not very on Twitter. Like okay. I, I don't really go onto my account, but I should. Um, it's just it's a, it's a time sucker. Um, no, I, I think that uh, the best thing to do would be to go to my Substack. It's MatthewArit.substack.com, and uh, there, there's the free option, the paid option. Obviously, you don't you know which one I'd prefer, but you know, the, try the free one out. Uh, there's our uh, our um, my wife and I run the Rising Tide Foundation.net. Um, which features weekly seminars, uh, all sorts of things which people can participate in. And finally, there's the Canadian Patriot Review.org, which features a little bit more of a geopolitical orientation. And uh, yeah, those, those I think would be pretty good starts. Amazing, super. There's one topic, one special topic I want to talk to you about. It's about you know the, the the technologies that we have been we've been somehow deprived of in the last you know hundred years or maybe or let's say at least in the last fifty years, which we have been talking about you know about nuclear f <laughs> uh, technology, fission, fu fusion, whatever, and and other you know potential technologies that could be evolving you know for the for the benefit of humanity. Uh, but we could do that some other time if you're yeah, open-minded yeah, yeah. for that. You know, that would, I would be love amazing. to. Yeah, I'd love to be. Yeah, just uh, at, that's a great topic. It's a it's a close to my heart. So for sure, just give me a give me a call. Yeah, maybe together with Jeff Wood, that would be a, an ideal, I think, uh, discussion partner. I think <laughs> okay. you, you would enjoy that. Uh, sure. So I really enjoyed that conversation, uh, Matthew. Learned a lot, and yeah, keep up the great work. I love your work, and uh, talk to you soon. Okay. All right, you too.